is Off Track with Hinch and Rossi. Uh, hello and welcome, guys, to Off Track, I guess, with uh, Hinch today. Rossi's not on this episode, which is very common for our Tuesday episodes. And amazingly, we have a guest this week, which we're very excited about. And despite our best efforts, Jamie Chadwick joins us today. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, we've given it a good go not to do this. Yeah, we've had uh, we've had a couple technical difficulties, which again we're going to blame on Tim, as we usually do. I mean, that's um, fair. That's fair. Yeah, <laughs> it is what it is. So, uh, Jamie, welcome. Thank you for taking the time, and sorry for the technical difficulties. That's just part and parcel with this show. Um, where so you said you're in Indy right now, right? We're we're recording this in between Gateway and Portland, so you're just back in Indy for a bit. Yes. Um, yeah, I feel like this is part of the experience. Getting the technical difficulties, getting the full Tim experience. Um, True. <laughs> yeah, back, back in Indy. Um, yeah, I don't actually live here um, yet, but it kind of ends up being where uh, for everyone, the bases in between races and then, yeah, over to Portland tomorrow. So are you, when you're in Indy, are you hoteling it? Have you like rented a place or what's the program? Um, a mix and match. Um, hotels, Airbnbs. Um, yeah, I really do need to get a place here. The amount of time I've spent here especially in hotels has been a lot this year. I feel like my hotel rewards are through the roof at the moment. So yeah, last year wasn't so busy, the schedule for Indie Next, but this year it really does feel like, yeah, I'm over here a lot more. Yeah, I had the same experience when I first started doing lights and I was like, it's probably good to just have like a room somewhere. So I had one of my mechanics, I rented a room in his house because I didn't want to be in out of hotels all the time. So I rented a room from him just for like when I was in town and I came down in April and that was 16 years ago. I haven't left. Wow. So yeah, I, I highly recommend getting a room, <laughs> but be warned, you may never leave. To okay, be clear, perfect. he's left the room. Yes, he's no, not, the room has changed. He's not the room is renting changed. that room. The room has no. changed into a house. I hope. Yes, the, but yes, I am, uh, I am still in Indianapolis. Uh, okay, well, look, we've wanted to have you on the show for a while. Uh, you're, you know, obviously such an incredible story and uh, becoming more and more of a name in open wheel racing here in North America. Coming from Europe, everybody knows Jamie Chavik over in Europe, over here, a bit of a newer name, newer to the scene. So we kind of wanted to, to kind of dive in and give fans on this side of the pond a little bit of a insight into who Jamie Chadwick is. So let's start from the beginning. Where are you from? Uh, where did you grow up? And where did the start, where did the interest in racing really come from? Yeah, so I'm from, from the UK. Um, I grew up um, originally in a small town um, in sort of the west of, of England. Um, but then I moved when I was younger to the Isle of Man, which for those that don't know, is like a tiny little island in between England and Ireland. Um, Where people like to kill themselves once Pretty much, year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's terrifying. So actually I'll give context to that. <laughs> yes, I was just going to say, we should give some references <laughs> just to what we mean by that. that. Um, yeah, and I survived. So um, yeah, I mean, it's where the TT um, happens, which is an insane bike race. Um, there's a lot of other motorsport there as well. And for such a small island to have that kind of um, event go on there, it's really is the, the staple um, blue ribbon event that that they have. And so the bike race is ludicrous. They're on the main roads. Um, if you watch any of the footage of it, it's insane. But it's I was obviously very young at the time. Um, lucky for my parents, I didn't sort of pick up a passion for two wheels at that point. But <laughs> I did enjoy the sort of speed. I loved watching it. We had the rally cars go past our house as well. Um, so that's when I first started, I guess, developing an interest a little bit for the sport, probably more subconsciously than um, being too aware of it. And then, yeah, when I was a little bit older, around at the age of 11 or 12, um, my brother started in go-karts. Um, well, he started a couple of years before that. And I sort of watched him do it. I thought, okay, that looks kind of fun, but I didn't really have much interest in it myself. I didn't watch Formula One or anything like that. Um, and then eventually I tried it and it was one of those kind of eureka moments. I, as soon as I sat in a go-kart, I was like, cool, this is this is fun. I want to keep doing this. Um, and it was always a hobby. It was never something I thought I would, well, I think have a chance of doing, um, professionally, I guess, or even thought was an option to be, um, a career. So yeah, started off as a hobby and has yeah, progressed from there really. Yeah. yeah I kind of had a similar feeling. Just never, a lot of kids get into hockey or soccer without ever thinking they're going to play it professionally, which is something fun to do on weekends. And, and here you go. Um, so, so no one in your family before your brother was into motorsports, really? No, they weren't at all. And I think that was, um, well, two sides of it. Uh, a blessing in a way, because it meant that we definitely weren't forced into it. 
if anything, my parents were like, what is this thing that we've got ourselves into? And, and um, they weren't smart enough to try to talk you out of it either. Exactly. <laughs> oh, they were just sort of riding the wave and we thought, you know, Carton was a bit of fun. And then obviously the further you get, the sort of well, more expensive, more stressful, everything it gets. Um, so they didn't know what was coming. Um, but um, yeah, to their credit, I mean, they completely supported us um, in what we wanted to do. So yeah, it was a like I said, a blessing in a way because we weren't forced into it. We did it because we enjoyed it. The ignorance we had was probably quite nice. Um, we kind of floated through the sport initially. I had no obvious pathway or trajectory to try and get through the sport. It was just take every year as it comes, keep trying to move on up. And yeah, I think that was a nice thing in a way and a really nice way to get into the sport because I see a lot of people don't have that that introduction yeah. into it. Yeah. So siblings, generally speaking, are fairly competitive Racing drivers are more competitive. Having you and Ollie both be drivers and siblings. I mean, what's Monopoly like? Like how quickly um, is the board flipped over? <laughs> from my personal side, fine. I think I, I think I was younger sibling, so I was quite chilled. Um, I was obviously competitive, but not in the obscene aggressive way that I feel like he was. Um, I feel like everything we did as kids would just end in World War Three. Um, and we're quite close in age. We're two years apart, so... Is it Everything just the two of you? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then, like I say, Monopoly, anything we would do um, would be chaos. And then when we started racing, um, it only got worse from there. <laughs> so we actually, we didn't knock it on, but we would argue so much when we were racing, particularly against each other. Um, and then now we get on well and we're kind of over that. Any any particularly bad on-track clashes with him? Um, I have a few. He'll sort of go over these as if they didn't matter or it didn't mean anything um <laughs> we had um we raced against each other a little bit in karting um and i remember overtaking him in the wet and i love how i remember the specific details of the specific corners of these <laughs> things <laughs> um, but yeah i remember overtaking him on the last lap and i came into the pits afterwards and um he hired me in the pits um straight into um the guy in front and i was like a 12 year old kid um, crying, pretending I had whiplash and all sorts. Um, and then the other one was um, when Janessa Juniors were racing against each other. And in those cars, you need to tow each other around. Um, and in qualifying, I gave him his tow. He went P1. Guy come up behind him. I'm getting my tow. We get on the back straight and then he's hard on the brakes. So I yeah. qualified like 12 or something. <laughs> oh, the gamesmanship. That no, must no. have been an interesting family dinner that night. Uh, horrendous. I feel sorry for yeah. my parents. <laughs> um, I need to take a quick uh, detour at this point because, so, you know, we started karting. You talked about getting up into Geneta Juniors, which I think is a fairly popular way for kids in England to kind of break into the sport, right? Even if you have open wheel aspirations, a lot of people start in, in the genetic cars, which I think is a, a really fun form. It looks awesome. I've never had a chance to travel. It looks awesome. But at some point, I read that you sort of had to make a bit of a decision on sporting career path because you were a hockey player? Yeah, field hockey player. So, um, ah, of course. Yeah, okay, okay. Slightly different to um, over in the States. But yeah, yes and no, I think that kind of um, statement has kind of been sort of blown out of proportion into, a bit. Yeah, maybe a little bit. I okay, don't know. All right. uh, um, it would have been quite as serious as it was. But I remember at the time, you know, I played loads of different sports growing up. And I think that's why. I enjoyed racing so much because I'd played other sports. I had that kind of competitiveness in me naturally. But when you get into racing and there's so many different elements to it and there's so much, in my opinion, so many more kind of um, parts to to being a racing driver, I just fell in love with it. And yeah, I played other sports. Like you said, um, I was playing hockey and there were sort of England um, trials and things at the time. And I went down the route of um, competing in um, motorsport instead of, instead of hockey and yeah, at the time it didn't seem like a big decision. Now it's uh, a lot of people bring it up and it, maybe it was a bigger decision. But at the time, hockey wasn't even a professional sport for women. Um, right. So it's not something I thought about as a kid, but actually it really wasn't, you know, what maybe it is now. Um, since I think GB have won gold medals and all sorts of the Olympics. So maybe maybe there was an opportunity to, to do something like that. But uh, I don't think too much like, about it now. I feel like it's working out okay. I feel like it's working out okay. <laughs> So you and your brother start racing, but it wasn't really in the family. Were your, were your family 
fans of the sport? Like, did you watch racing at this point? Were you watching Formula One races? Were you a fan of motorsports? A little bit, but not huge. Um, you know, we'd always have like F1 on on Sundays. Um, it wasn't something that we didn't know anything about, but it wasn't something we followed religiously. Um, right. But my brother followed it a lot more than I did. And he started karting a year or two before me. So he naturally got into it earlier. Um, and then even when I started in karting, it wasn't something I followed hugely. Um, like I said, I just enjoyed karting, enjoyed floating through the sport initially. Um, but then as I got older, I became well, someone that was involved in the sport, but then also a fan of the sport quite quickly. Um, and I think I still have that fan of the sport element in me as well, for sure. So then when that sort of fandom part crept in and it wasn't just a hobby and you're starting to take it a bit more seriously, who were your racing heroes at that point? Um, it's funny. There's a lot of people I look at and I used to say, well, not used to say were my heroes, but I really felt like they were the ones that I wanted to, um, yeah, I looked up to and wanted to be like, and when I was starting to watch the sport, um, Alonso was one of them. Slightly randomly, Jensen Button was one. Um, I don't want to say random. slightly randomly at all. Yeah, world champion, now, kind of a good deal. <laughs> yeah, I now see him um, a lot at F1 races and things. And it's to me, it's quite overwhelming because, like I say, I used to really look up to him and think he was um, a driver I wanted to be like. Um, he was always super smooth, especially in the wet. And I was like, that's the driver I want to be. Um, and then obviously the likes of Lewis Hamilton. So you're kind of typical big names um, were the ones that I looked up to. Um, and... Yeah, I just thought they were complete superstars and rock stars and they still obviously are, but it was crazy that, yeah, now, how many years later, you're not too far away or in worlds that are too separate to them, which is, is crazy to me. Yeah, yeah. So you started in cars on the, I guess we, we call it Janetta sports car, like bruise and fenders, right? Did some GT racing, had some success. Then there was the transition into open wheel. Was that something that, you actively pursued or was an open wheel transition just kind of something that was presented to you and you jumped at it? Um, a little bit of both. Um, I wasn't all for the idea of doing it, to be honest. Um, I really enjoyed, I was, yeah, like you say, went straight sort of into sports cars, really enjoyed doing that. I was competing in the UK predominantly and yeah, I was really enjoying that style of racing, the endurance style. Um, but I did always get um, a lot of interest around this at the Formula One question. Um, and aside from the Formula One question, I think the amount you learn in single seaters and open wheel stuff is is huge because the focus is all on the driver. Um, you're the only driver in the car. You get a lot of, um, yeah, attention seat time. When you go to sports cars, it's more of a team focus. You're sharing the car with other people. Um, and I think the skill set that I needed and what I needed to learn and develop kind of came from going into open wheel um, cars. And that combined with trying to sort of push the sort of Formula One narrative um, opportunities that presented themselves. So I went into to British F3 at the time, um, which was actually a much bigger transition than I was expecting going from sports cars into open wheel racing. But yeah, definitely one I'm, I'm happy I made. So what were some of those kind of unexpected challenges going into open wheel? Um, I think a few things. Um, I mean, for me, it was weird because I raced on all the circuits that I was racing on um, in a sports car. I then raced on in this British F3 car. And so all my references, everything that was kind of ingrained in me from driving everything else was were completely different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so retraining your brain, a corner that used to be breaking and going down a gear is now flat out, um, was a challenge for sure initially. Um, physically more of a challenge. Um, you know, you don't have power steering in the open wheel cars, your neck, everything. Um, the G-forces are much higher. Um, and then, yeah, I think just the margins were so small. Um, you know, I feel like you get up to speed, but then suddenly the the differences are so small in the sport in general, but they're so minute. The difference between, yeah, being 10th to the back of the grid to them being in the top 10 was um, very, very narrow. And had some success in F3, won a race there. Again, probably just putting your name more and more on the map. And then was it, was post F3 when W Series kicked in? Uh, more or less. Yeah. So yeah. second year of F3 W series came along, which was kind of the perfect timing for me. Cause I don't think I would have continued in the sport without, without W series coming around. So, all right. So let's talk to me about when you first started hearing about this concept of an all women's formula series, and then kind of what was the process of how they selected the drivers and how did you ultimately end up there? Yeah. So I'm, I actually 
one of those things that I didn't hear about it way before it happened. Um, I think I heard some murmurings and then literally two weeks later, it's like, send your You read the press in. release like everyone exactly. else kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So it wasn't like, you know, in mode sport, I feel like we all know everything and the rumors we all hear before. And then, you know, it's no surprise when it's announced. I really thought, you know, this was never going to happen if it was an idea or if it, you know, was something it wasn't going to come into fruition, but it really did. Um, and honestly, I didn't, I've said so many times, I never thought it was a good idea because at the time I was competing in mixed competition, having some success, but not loads of success, um, but enough success for me to know that I was capable of competing in mixed competition. Um, and I didn't really understand the need for it, to be honest. Um, but on the flip side of it, um, I remember having calls with the likes of David Coulthard, um, a guy called Dave Ryan, um, you know, a lot of the people that were behind it. And really, they were saying that they want to give you as much seat time as possible. It's fully funded. There's prize money effectively professionalized women's motorsport, which is already incredibly niche. Um, but it was an unbelievable opportunity. So actually, when I started to learn more about it, it was an opportunity I jumped at. Um, whether it was the right thing or is or wasn't the right thing for the sport, um, I still don't fully know. But personally, um, it was my saving grace in my career and has done a huge amount for me. So being, I guess, um, selfish about it, I think I'll always be grateful for, for the W Series for what they managed to do. Yeah, and you took advantage of the opportunity. I mean, let's not just brush over the three consecutive titles in it, uh, undefeated in the championship in the three years of its existence. But you just brought something up that I did want to talk about. I was saving it for later, but you brought it up, so let's talk about it. There are... I've always been fascinated talking to women in the sport and seeing the sort of mixed view of the idea of an all-female series yeah, at whatever level or whatever type of car or whatever. There does seem to be a bit of a split. And it sounds like even though you were one of the biggest benefactors of that, you're not necessarily sold on the concept, it sounds like. I think I'm just all for everyone having as much opportunity as they can. Uh, and I love the fact that, you know, well, personally, I love the fact it gave me a huge opportunity because, <laughs> like I say, I wouldn't have been um, in the sport otherwise. But there are so many others that I think have massively um, benefited. And it's from a visibility point of view, I think no one can deny what they did um, has had success. And I think, in my opinion, um, when it was first announced, everyone expected it to fail. Um, maybe not everyone, but a lot of people. And I think a lot of people wouldn't have expected it to get the viewership it got, the sponsorship endorsements that it got, the... Um, amount of TV coverage, this kind of stuff. And I think the fact that it got that, I think really did give, um, you know, women a platform in the sport that they otherwise wouldn't have had. It showed the desire and the appetite that there is clearly for women to have success in the sport. Um, and I think all of these things can't get brushed over. Um, I really do think that it's done more good than than bad um, for our sport. So that's the way I look at it. But at the same time, you know, we want to see women competing at the highest level equally against men. Um, I believe that we're capable of seeing that. I think it's an, predominantly a numbers game. There are other factors as well, but predominantly a numbers game. And we're not going to see that, unfortunately, if we haven't got enough young girls starting in go-karts, starting in um, the feeder series. So really, in my opinion, that's the bit we need to be focusing on and pushing and Hopefully the rest is just time. That actually brings up something I wanted to talk about because there's obviously a lot of pressure for anybody who's strapping into a race car, right? Like there's, you're competing against everybody else. You're going to, even as a great driver, you're going to lose more than you're going to win unless you're Max Verstappen. Like how, how much extra pressure do you have? Do, do you feel like you have to be a representative as, as a woman in a male dominated sport, like trying to help usher the next generation of girls into karting. This is a really interesting one because um, I think this is a double edged sword, isn't it? Um, you know, I came to America with. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's a double edged sword. Yeah, I came to America <laughs> with a huge opportunity um, that I wouldn't have had if I didn't have W Series um, or didn't have, well, wasn't a woman in the sport because, um, you know, the likes of DHL and Dretti came on, supported me in my first year over here. Um, I wouldn't have had that without, you know, being a woman in the sport, putting it blankly, um, bluntly. But on the flip side of that, yes, there's then this added social pressure um, that kind of felt a little bit like, you know, my success kind of, or lack of success in my first year especially, um, 
you know, dictates the future of women in motorsport. A little bit, yeah. yeah, and yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. That shouldn't be the case. You look at, you know, how many women have had success over here, especially um, in IndyCar. You know, it's it doesn't matter. In my opinion, it shouldn't matter what, you know, I was doing. Obviously, that's frustrating for me personally. It's frustrating for those that invested in me, but it shouldn't um, reflect on a gender as a whole. So there's sort of two sides of it. But like I said, it's a double-edged sword. And on the flip side of it, the reality of the opportunities that we have now. Um, and I think being a woman in the sport, there's so many great opportunities. And that's why I say to anyone, especially young girls getting into it, there's so many now doors opening. Um, and yeah, I think desire, like I said, to have women at the highest level, that the time is now. It's, it's such a great opportunity. Guys, I hope you're enjoying this chat with Jamie Chadwick as much as we are. And I hope you tune in for the next part. This is only half of our chat with Jamie. So inspiring so far, but make sure you tune in next week for part two, where we learn a little bit more about her seasons in Indy Next and her upcoming IndyCar test. This has been Off Track with Hinch and Rossi. Off Track is part of the Sirius XM Sports Podcast Network. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, please give us a five-star rating and leave a review. Subscribe today wherever you stream your podcasts. We're at Ask Off Track on Twitter and Instagram. If you want to follow us on Twitter individually, I'm at Hinchtown. He's Alexander Rossi. And if you want to follow Fim, though we have no idea why you would, he's at the Tim Durham on Twitter. Follow us on YouTube and subscribe to our channel for exclusive video content. Off Track is produced by Tim Durham. And by that, we mean Fim. Thank you.